Welcome, everyone. I'm Marianne Monaraj. I'm director of the Speculative Literature Foundation um, and also a writer. And I'm here today with editors Sheila Williams of Asimov Science Fiction and Fantasy Magazine. I hope I got the full name right. I just call it Asimov's. Um, and Neil Clark of Clark's World. And uh, I'm super excited to be here with them. I, it was a dream of mine to be published in both of these magazines. I've managed it once. They've also rejected me multiple times. Um, and that's just the way it goes. But I was very excited with those publications. Um, so I'm going to start. Um, we'll, we're, we'll start with some sort of questions geared towards uh, newer writers and then um, maybe a little bit more of uh, a general conversation. I have some I have some questions that I'm interested in hearing the answers to. But for newer writers, there's kind of the standard advice of read the magazine, right, as a good first step, right? Um, so I'm guessing that you would you would echo that. But beyond that, um, are there any specific things you'd like people to do before submitting to uh, Asimov's or Clark's World? Um, anything you'd like to say about maybe like what kinds of stories you're looking for? Is there a classic Asimov story or a Clark's World story, um, and maybe there isn't, but I'll, I just wanna give you the chance to talk a little bit about your publications and uh, what you're looking for generally. So um, Sheila, I'll start with you. <laughs> okay, and I think you've sold me two stories, not just I one. have, I have told you two stories, <laughs> um, <laughs> very exciting. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know, you, you're absolutely right. People should definitely familiarize themselves with the magazine and they should familiarize themselves with the writer's guidelines. And um, we don't, um, one thing I think that many editors would agree with me is that we don't want the next story to be exactly the same as the story we just published. We are looking for things that are, you know, that are always a little bit different from what we've published, but there is a sense of, by reading and being familiar with the magazine of, of having a familiarity with the kind of story that an editor likes. I think it's important to know things like at Asimov's, it is not, it's Isaac Asimov's science fiction magazine, or it's not Isaac anymore, Asimov's science fiction magazine. We do publish a little bit of, a little fantasy and a very tiny bit of horror, but we're not uh, primarily, we don't publish, it's not a balanced, it's not well balanced. We don't publish a lot of fantasy. We certainly don't publish um, much in the way of fantasy tropes. Mm. Although there's always an exception. I have a troll story coming out, but um, but the truth is we don't publish a lot of stories that have to do with you know um, oh, goblins and dragons and um, wizards or you know mm. they have to be a very odd reason why or an unusual reason or you know something particularly uh well done that would make me interested in that and i do have some darker or more um fantasy oriented stories in my slightly spooky september october issue so there is always hope for authors to but i just want to say that by and large a dragon story is not that likely to get published in Asimov's unless perhaps it has kind of a science fiction twist to it or something, you know, that would make it more interesting to me for my particular audience and taste. Um, but I'm always looking for new writers. Uh, we, we lose the old writers, we lose the regulars all the time to their, their novels, their lifestyle, whatever they, they, um, we have no way to depend on a stable of authors. That's just an impossibility. So I'm constantly on the lookout and uh, Neil designed my submission system. <laughs> terrific, a terrific system. I love it and it keeps me very organized. But when one of the things about it is I download 20 to 50 stories at a time and I don't look at the cover letter. I just look at the story, go right down through the stories. And so you, the, I think begin, all beginning writers should know that they're pretty equal. I'm not looking at their credentials before I read the story. I'm looking at their story first. If the story appeals to me, I might go, I'm going to go back and look at, see if there's any information about them in their cover letter. But it's really the story that's selling itself to me. And so I, I think right, beginning writers should really know that it's a pretty 
even playing field for most people. And, um, you know, I'm very open. So I don't want to hog this whole thing. Let Neil talk now. <laughs> that was great. I'll, 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 uh, I'll just add in, you know, I've been reading Asimov since I was about 10 years old. Um, and I, I would have a hard time trying to tell people what a classic Asimov story is. I think you cover a really wide range. I was just reading um, uh, a back issue recently. I think it was the March, April, 2020 issue. And you had, you opened with this Jason Sanford story about these uh, cloud, pe people uploading into the cloud um, connected to religion. And then the next story was this Jim Gum piece that was in completely different in theme, completely different in style, um, and both really interesting, but really, really different. Um, so I think it, I, I really do think, I'd, I just want to emphasize, read at least a few issues of any magazine you're going to submit to. Um, and one thing I did when I was in grad school for writing is I would just, I didn't have a lot of money, didn't have a big budget. So I, I subscribed to a different magazine every year. That was my like, that was my commitment is that I would go, I'd subscribe to Asimov's one year, et cetera, so on. Um, and of course there's the library. So um, Neil, I'll pass it to you. Okay, well, Sheila hit on a lot of the, the, the big points, like, you know, read the guidelines. Um, in the guidelines, there's some specific things that you, you might not be paying close enough attention to formatting. Um, uh, you know, we're, I, I'm not, I'm, like we we all tend to recommend the same formatting guidelines, but we're I'm not religious about it in, in, in regards. I, I allow some flexibility. Don't give me something that's got photos and color backgrounds and and everything. You know, nice simple stuff. Um, uh, uh, I do the same thing with cover letters. I read them last. I consider them a second chance. Um, you might tell me something there that might convince me to go back and look. And those things that you might tell me is one, you might be a new writer. Um, two, you might be um, uh, uh, a younger writer. And three, you might be somebody whose English is their second language. Um, so those three groups tend, tend to um, uh, make certain types of mistakes that might not immediately be apparent that that's what I'm seeing. So with a little extra work, I might be able to get around those. Um, let's see. Uh, uh, the, um, the other thing is, is that, you know, we do want the new writers. Um, I can tell you that since December, um, we, ha we have had a new writer, a first sale in each issue. Um, and I, I don't think we're going to continue that next month, but it's, it's a nice streak to have. And it makes me very happy. Um, every editor I know loves to have that happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so don't self-reject. Don't think, you know what I want. Cause I don't, I don't know what I want. I, I know it when I see it. Um, so send me your, your, uh, the story you're most passionate about. Be don't write a story for me. Um, because odds are you're writing something that I've, uh, or writing at a target where I've already moved on from. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, don't self-reject and things like that. Um, yeah. I, I don't really have much else to add there. <laughs> that's, okay, that's okay. I'll ask you more specific questions. That's, that's great. I, and I'll, I, I'll emphasize the, I, I thought it was really interesting what you said that um, that if they are a younger writer or a newer writer or someone for whom English is a second language, that's that's a reason to take a second look at the story because um, you might you might be if there was something presumably something else interesting in the story, but those mechanical errors or so on were getting in the way, you might be willing to bring a newer writer along a little bit. It's, right? it's but, a matter of adjusting your expectations a little. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, we're used to seeing so much and particularly with, um, English as a second language, some of those mistakes can come across as, 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 as a lack of, of competency, competency in their work when it's actually just a, a, a language issue. And those are very easy to work around. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, you know, the, the sad thing too, is that a lot of plagiarized stories look like they're, they're written because there's a lot of software out there now for, for making plagiarism easy, um, mm -hmm. it turns it into stories that 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 could be poor English, 
Um, and so it's, it's one of those things I try to be careful of that I don't want to um, discard something quickly because it looked like it might be plagiarized. Oh, that's really interesting. <laughs> I had not, I had not run into that, but um, I can, I can see it. Uh, I also want to, I want to emphasize, I, I think for both of the, your magazines are so prominent in the field, have won so many awards. I do think a lot of my students, for example, might assume that, you know, oh, all of the slots are going to really experienced award-winning writers and I, I wouldn't have a shot here. And um, I know one of the most exciting things for any editor is discovering a new writer they're excited about. So um, you both said that, I just, yeah. I just want to emphasize it. Well, I, think I, should, I, I think I should add one thing. Both mm -hmm. Sheila and I don't solicit stories or very, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all coming from slush. Um, and, and there are a number of other markets that, that heavily solicit. So um, you know, I think it, it, it says something th um, that we're quite open uh, to new writers and not trying to name pick uh, um, just just off the way we do our run our businesses. And I want to add, you know, everyone has to start everyone, even the most famous authors had to start somewhere. And, you know, I published the first um, science fiction story by Ray Naylor, and I published the first story by Greg both are, and there's a huge list of people. Some people I published the first story of, and they've only sold one or two others since then. And others, you know, are have become very well known. But it's really the man. It, the truth is, everyone had to get their foot in the door somewhere. And you know, a lot of the time, it's going to be our magazines. It's it's just you know, the you know, even you know Neil Gaiman had to have a first sale somewhere. So it's not. Not like you know, no one, no one is born. You know, no one comes fully born on the, on mm -hmm. the shell. You know, it's it's um, um, we we really are constantly looking for new people, and it's amazing. You know, and we're always so amazed at that. It's so exciting to find someone. A lot of times, I'm slightly disappointed. I find out, well, actually, no, I'm their second sale or their third sale, but I hadn't <laughs> heard of them before. They're brand new to me, so that's fine with me too. You know, and um. And it's also a validation for that author that they can sell to more than one editor. And, and um, so I'm, I'm giving them early validation too, just by buying this story from some new newish person. But um, no, I mean, on every next issue box, when I write about the upcoming issue, there's always, I always mention the people who have their first, at least their first story in Asimov's. And there's always people in that list. It's just, um, you know, it, it's part of putting the magazine together and um, and also new people always have a, their own slightly different viewpoint from everyone else and everyone, each author has their own viewpoints, but they have this refreshing new viewpoint that we haven't seen before because they are new. So that's a very, it's very exciting and, and a part of the mix that we really want in the magazine. Yeah, I can't remember the quote exactly offhand but Neil Gaiman has a, a good line about you know the the main thing you bring to the story is you right this is what you have that nobody else can put in the story right you can everyone can learn craft you can learn how to plot well how to build character all of those aspects of it um, but no one else has your voice right so um, so lean into that I guess is what I mean yeah. what I tell my students anyway right lean into your perspective and your voice um, can I ask, just as a quick question, I'm uh, just curious how far out, you know, I think Neil said something about, you know, not trying to write to the market to what you think he wants, um, because he'll have moved on from it by the time, you know, by the, by the time the story gets accepted. Um, how far out do you buy and publish? Are you like three months out, six months out, a year out? Is it very variable? Um, either one. Uh, Sheila? Well, shockingly to everybody, I yesterday um, put through a request for my first 2023 story. <laughs> and um, um, that would be for probably for January, February, 2023, because I've already, I've, I actually have a few other stories that will end up in 2023 because I yesterday also laid out my November, December issue. Mm -hmm. So, but this one I knew as I was asking, as I was, buying it that it was definitely going to appear in 2023 um but so that's how so i have um i i have put may june i'm done with 
I don't know if it's come out. I don't think it's come out yet. I'm not sure. Um, I'm finishing up July, August, 2022. I have laid out September, October, and now I've laid out November, December, and they are in various stages. There's so many different stages of production. I don't know if anyone wants to hear about that, but but they're all, you know, so they're all, um, they're all, that's the hardest part for me sometimes is when an author says, what issue is my story in? And I'm thinking, well, I'm working on your story, but I forget which one it's going with because I've got four issues I'm working on in one way or another. But, um, but yeah, so it's with the print magazine, it's a lot different from mm-hmm. uh, online in that we're really, um, you know, they used to say about public publishing that it was like having a baby, that it was roughly nine months from um, buying something till it appeared in print. And I, mean, I haven't really looked to see if that's absolutely true, but there's certain, certainly does take a few months. That's for sure. Okay. That's great. And so you're not, you're, so you've got both the print production schedule to contend with and, um, and you're buying you know how how far ahead you've bought. It sounds like you you don't have years worth of stories that you've already. No, I, I yeah. can't do that. You know, there's this thing called inventory. <laughs> there's this thing called my parent company, and um, as much as I might like to have, uh, I certainly like to have at least fifty pages of story left over when I lay out an issue. Though I often don't. I'm sometimes mm-hmm. I'm right down to the, um, mm-hmm. but I can't really keep a large inventory because it ties up money, you know, and um, I actually, every so often an author gets very worried about, you know, wants me to put in a contract that I'll use the story within a certain amount of time, but, you know, and within reason, I'll consider that, but it's nothing really sits around very long because, you know, because I don't, because, well, it's also hard. It's a lot of work finding basically every issue of Asimov's is roughly 185 pages of fiction of you know our standard size and you would think that sounds easy to fill but it's not it's a lot of work to find those stories you know it's a um I can read through a thousand stories of people I you know new authors and and I'll find just a couple of new stories so it's um it's, okay, it, so I'm, I'm going to hold that thought because I'm going to, I'm going to, my next question for you both will be what kinds of things have made stories stand out for you? But, um, so think about that, but Neil, if you could just quickly answer the production question, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so. um, it can be as fast as weeks. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the, we generally don't have more than three months of inventory. A story might be held longer than that because we have to balance an issue. So -hmm. if we get a novella, we need some shorter stories to pair up with it. And if we don't have any, that novella could sit for a while. And the other direction around, if we have a bunch of really Mm -hmm. short things, we want some longer ones to go to to balance out the issue or to fill fill the issue. So um, I am still working on the April issue, which comes out on the first, um, (laughs) which is just a few days away. Um, at this stage, we're done with the editing and all of that. We're, we're more and more in production. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it can be very fast. And um, we produce in uh, the online and ebook editions will come out on the first and the print edition will usually come out around middle to late month. During the p- pandemic, it's been later just due to printer delays. All right. Thank you. Okay, so away from the nitty gritty, back to um, what makes a story stand out for you. So one of the things I, I said this uh, the last time we had this panel, but you guys weren't here, so I'll say it again. When I'm editing for an anthology, I think because I'm an academic, I tend to use a an A B C D grading system, right? And so just for myself, so so D's and F's are the ones that are like they are off topic for the anthology. I don't know, you know, like, I don't know why this person submitted this story to me, right? So those are, um, or it is someone for whom sometimes I will get someone for whom English is a second language, but they would have so far to go that it's almost unreadable, right? And I, I don't have the time to work with them on that. Most stories I get I would say are Bs. They are competent, right? They are, they're not even Cs. They're B stories. Um, and there's, there's nothing really wrong with them, but 
they don't excite me. The ones that excite me end up being A's. So and I know you probably don't use the same system, but but can you talk a little bit about what kinds of things have tended to, you know, as you read through this vast amount of material, what makes you jump up and take notice? Uh, maybe we'll start with Neil. So just to switch things. Okay. My grading system is yes, no. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's a pass fail course with me. That's right. um, and you'd think that'd be easier, but it's not. Um, <laughs> Um, the the thing that I look surprise me, mm-hmm. um, uh, make me think about something in a different way or from a different perspective, make me feel something, uh, make me care about the character. Uh, you know, any one of these things or a combination of them, uh, uh, and, and and yeah, like there's no magic way of doing that. I mean, you can do it a million different ways, and what works for me may not work for Sheila, um, uh, and. and you know, it, it's it's a very difficult thing to just poke on it, sort of like a you know it when you see it sort of thing. Um, and I think I think it's it's easier for for people who haven't read slush or or edited to think of it in terms of when you're reading things. How do you decide which like when you're reading through an anthology? What was your favorite story in that? Why? Um, you know, it, it's it's very much the same, same for us. We're just reading a lot more and mm-hmm. we're reading the stuff that's also unpublished. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I'd say, I mean, I would tell my students slush reading is, is good training. So, um, mm-hmm. so if you get a chance to do some reading for a magazine, you will, it's, it's definitely an education in, when you see what everyone else is sending in. Um, Sheila, do you want to? Uh, yeah, it's, it is. It's, there's a sense, I think, with a, with a lot of the stories I end up buying, that the author has a, has control over the story, knows where it's going. I have a, I get that sense right from the start that, um, and that it's not just oh, and this happened and then that happened. There's kind of a, there's usually always some subtext in the story. Um, there's some complexity, but there's also, especially people I've never heard of before. I was just thinking one story where. There's this character who isn't even the main character in the story, but turning the story opens, and this character is like doing headstands or somersaults in the mm-hmm. parking lot of this diner and lands on their head. And I'm like, why? <laughs> this is why is this happening? It just was a very different opening from the usual, you know, it was just very kind of, well, why is this character doing that? So there's that kind of a curiosity, something interesting that was different from things I'd seen before and um, kept me reading. And I found the story very intriguing and I did buy it um, with some revisions, work with the author and then I bought it. Um, There are other, uh, you know, I, of course I'm looking for strong characters that Usually, and not always, but there you get a story to give me a, a strong emotional reaction of some sort. Um, it doesn't have to be happy or, or tragic, you know, it could be all kinds of reactions. Um, and uh, I love really well told science fiction where there's an emphasis on the science, but those are hard stories to pull off with great characters and interesting plots terrific world building. This science fiction asks a lot of its authors, but um, but it's very rewarding when you can when that all comes together. Yeah, I'm always envious of people who have a science background. Like one of my former Clarion students, E.J. Fisher, sold a story to Asimov's The New Mother, which has clearly a lot of biology knowledge that he brought to the story that I could not have written that. <laughs> so if you have that science um, knowledge and or are willing to do the research. Um, I think that can be a great way in. I I want to I'll echo just a couple things I heard you both say. You know, I, I I really liked what you had to say, Sheila, about having a confident sort of voice, kind of from the beginning of the story, because I think that's something that I definitely that catches me too. Like if I pick up a short story or a novel, if I feel like the author clearly has something in mind, knows what they're doing, and they're carrying me along. Um, I'm, I'm willing to go with it. Um, and some, sometimes it's hard to like put into words what that actually is, right? Like, what is it that makes something seem uncertain, but, but there is, 
there is a difference. Um, also, you said complexity. I think often when when I'm reading for an anthology, people will often, and it's on a theme, they will often kind of I'll get many stories about the most obvious thing that you could write about that theme. And so um, I know you guys aren't reading on theme, but even so, I think it's sort of similar advice maybe to like, you know, what's your first take on this story and this idea? And then is there a more complex version of it? Is there a second thought or a third thought that would be more interesting? Uh, you talked about emotion. Um, and then Neil, I'm sorry, I'm blanking there. I should have taken a note. You talked about something that I wanted to mention again, and now I can't remember. Well, on the Zoom, people can people can look at the YouTube and scroll back, so they can they can go back and repeat what you said. So, um, yeah. Okay. Let me let me. I'm going to switch to another question. I'll, I'll remind everybody. Feel please feel free to just throw questions you have in the chat. I uh, would love to have you direct this towards the things that you're interested in, because otherwise I can talk to them forever, uh, but, uh, but this is for you. So one thing you mentioned, Sheila, the, the print um, constraints. And one thing my students ask me, and this, this may be a little touchy of a topic, so, I, so I'll, I'll, I'm, I'll just frame that. Um, but my students ask me whether they should publish online or in print, does it matter? How do they decide where to submit to first? Um, you know, and some of deciding where to submit to, I tell them about Black Hole, which uh, tracks response times. And um, certainly people look at pay rates, you both pay very well, <laughs> thanks for that. Um, uh, and you have a broad readership, which people love, but maybe you could just talk a little bit about what, if there's any differences in um, publishing in print or online, um, any advantages, disadvantages? And I don't mean to make like put you on the spot to like defend the fact that you have this kind of magazine or that kind of magazine, right? And I, I think you both actually do other edition, like even though Clark's World is primarily online, I think you put out print collections, right? And Asimov's, I think you can get it digitally. I'm not sure. Um, I've, I've only read the print version, so maybe you could just talk a little about that. Um, so Sheila, I'll throw it to Sheila first. Okay, well, we are available for digital, um, yeah. digital downloads. We sell on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and various other places. Um, and they're pretty popular. We mm -hmm. were actually Amazon's 11th through 14th because four of our magazines went up on their in their magazine section um, when Amazon first started when the Kindle first started having magazines um, so we're we're um, we're available there and of course we're primarily known as a print magazine we have print subscribers we're also available on the newsstand I think the biggest we can there are some fun things you can do in print that are different from what are done on online but um the biggest difference of course is that you have to pay a subscription mm -hmm. to read the magazine and um and not all online magazines are i mean i i believe uh there there are some behind paywalls right there are some behind paywalls walls but but that's the biggest difference and that's probably going to stay that way for a while anyways we um we we survive on you know we we have committed readers who subscribe to the magazine and um means the editors get paid a living a living wage and get health insurance and vacation pay and um you know they're just basically it's a really great job wonderful job actually but um it, it means I have heard people say, well, I would read that story, but I couldn't get it for free. And, you know, that's just, that's the choice that people make. And um, I always say, well, you know, you pay for your toothpaste, you know, you don't expect that for free and you, you expect, you know, you, you know, it's the, the food that you eat isn't free, et cetera. So I feel like reading and stories are as valuable in many ways as, sustenance in other ways so but that's a choice the reader makes and um you know I haven't got any I have no objections to any other way of presenting the stories at all it's just that's our model for publication mm -hmm. yeah great Neil so 
uh, our models go where the readers are. Um, so we started online. Um, we do an annual print anthology. Uh, well, regularly, annually. Um, and uh, we do uh, print standalone issues, audio versions as podcasts for each story, and, and ebooks. We were the, the third science fiction magazine behind uh, Analog and Asimov's in Kindle. Um, we just beat FNSF, so that's a matter of pride for us. Um, and uh, um, we're in Barnes and Noble and all the other places. And, and Actually, I, I, it, it just occurred to me. I, I don't know why I didn't think of this before. I can subscribe to Clark's World on my Kindle. Yes. And Asimov's. <laughs> I should yeah. do that. That would be much easier. OK. All right. Good. Yeah, yeah I learned. And, something. and uh, well, that, that's that's good. It just paid for my uh, my time today. <laughs> yeah, but, pictures on our Kindles, <laughs> they're, they're not it's the photos that you see in black and white are actually in color in the Kindle. Ooh. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Excellent. The, um, but I, I, you know, I have to echo what Sheila said about reader choice and reader choice and not paying for things. That's why we have markets that close. Mm -hmm. All right. So we've lost a few magazines in the last few years and largely because they didn't have enough money. You've got others that have to do Kickstarter campaigns every year, which is a very stressful way of living a sword hanging over your head for a month to decide whether or not your business stays around another year. Um, these are all really awful things that we have to do because not enough people. And, and I, I'm not um, saying that I do Kickstarter campaigns for that. That's I won't. Um, but the, um, the, the, uh, the state of, of most, the majority of the magazines are at this point online or digital or some combination of, I'm, uh, and I don't know of any of them that have more than, or even close to 10% of their readership actually paying them. That's bad. A lot of the staff at magazines are, are unpaid. So that's the negative for some of these markets is they could disappear. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes disappear before they've published your story. Um, the positive side is increased visibility and availability. Like if, if we've been around for 15 years, every story we've published over 15 years is still available for people to read. So they know where to find it. They can go back and get it. The authors tend to like it because they can just link to it from their website and don't have to worry about it. Um, it Judging by the awards, sadly, it does seem to be having an impact on the awards, and, um, but it also looks like campaigning is also playing a role in that. So we'll, we'll throw that off to the side. Um, uh, but I, I think that uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the eyeballs tends to be the one that draws the most attention. Um, uh, you know, we, we know that we have conservatively over 50,000 people reading each issue. Um, and it sort of dispels the myth that, that only short fiction writers read short fiction, because I can tell you looking at the slush pile and looking at the submissions information and, and, um, and the subscription information, it doesn't match up. Um, there is a large community of people who are reading who don't write. Um, but there's also a lot more writers than there were when we first started 15 years ago. Well, I think you also have much broader reach than we did 15 years ago, right? I mean, you're going to get, you're getting submissions, I'm assuming from far more international submissions than, than we did back then too, right? So. Well, yes, we, we do get a lot, of, but we've always done online submissions. So that, that hasn't been the obstacle. The obstacle is more a culture of not feeling welcome in, in, in uh, U.S. publishing. Um, uh, and we've done a lot of work to help break through some of that. So we're, we're kind of happy with the way that's, that's moving. We always want to see it a little bit more. I think, I think the U S is something like, you know, under 10% of the global population, but it makes up over 60% of the slush pile. Um, and, and there's a lot of different languages in the mix too. So it's, you know, I'd have to recalculate based on English. Um, but it's, it's, a uh, it's a lot better than it was then, but the big difference between 15 years ago and now is acceptability. It was not accepted by mainstream science fiction writers um, to be published online. They thought it was the place where all the where piracy was rampant and newbie writers would be published. Uh, and that's changed. 
Sheila, did you, you look like you wanted to add something? Yeah, except now I'm trying to remember what I was going to say. <laughs> okay. um, it was something on... Um, With the internationalization? Oh, the international, yes, yes. We, I would also add we are published in the United States, which I think is partly why we have a huge amount of people from the United States sending, and this continent in general sending material. But it has been great. We have seen a lot more stories from people in um say india yeah. and um and a number of african countries recently that i've you know um and i've been buying stories from people from you know uh, so many different countries lately um i mean i'm dealing i'm working with a really terrific author right now who is french canadian and has written mostly in french and so um and that's very interesting when you're talking about somebody whose first language i mean I'm sure her English is fluent, but she self-translates. But mm -hmm. sometimes there's such interesting <laughs> differences, you know. Um, you see that sometimes with the Elliot de Bedard's work, right? That, yeah. you know, she's like, English is her third language, I think. It's like Vietnamese, French, and English. And she's very fluent in English, but there's like little turns of phrase and so on that are a little um, yeah. revelatory. Um, so just to... I, I want to highlight the awards thing only because it, it frustrates me, honestly, a little bit, right? So I think it's it's a, a little bit of a problem in the field right now that because it is much easier for people to share a story that they like that was published online for free, I do think that that ends up affecting um, what end up on finalist lists for awards. And I'm not sure what the solution is for that, but I, people should be aware that there's a, a gap there and it's it means that the awards are not necessarily very reflective of the breadth of what's being published. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I will say from a teacher's point of view, you know, there are a lot of us who assign science fiction. And if we're teaching in um, urban environments where our students don't have a lot of money for textbooks, um, being able to assign free stories um, is, is hugely helpful to them. So, um, so I think there is sort of a tendency to lean towards those stories as well. Um, I, I don't know. I would love to see Asimov's, I, I don't know how much it would carve into your budget. I just, I just don't know. Right. I'd love to see, you know, it, like after a year after publication, all the back issues go online or something. And maybe that's yeah. not feasible. I don't know. We have, a, basically an agreement with CIFA that we can, published back nine issues. Mm -hmm. um, so we can have nine months available, say at Amazon or something. I don't know if you can actually buy the back issues. This is electronically. Obviously we can sell our print ones till we run out of them at the warehouse, but um, but we have a contractual agreement or not, a con I guess if we've worked it out, I don't know if it's an actual contract that we um, aren't offering more than that it would have to be really negotiated there are authors who don't want i mean there are people who sell to asimov's and they're not a lot but partly because they know there isn't going they, they can they can control whether the story goes up online or not um yeah. neil knows i had a terrific story that no one could even put into a best of the year anthology because you know the of co contract complications and the only reason i got the story was because I was a print magazine, um, but we, I do run my finalists for the, the um, for the asthma, the reader's award, put right. them all up. And uh, I used to leave them up forever, but then we ran into again, some problems with a couple of agents who got really mad when they discovered their author's stories were still up online. So oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah, so I had my intern take not just break links, but take them all down, you know, which then upset a few authors. But I was like, well, you can put your story back. I'm not, you know, but yeah. I just don't want to run into problems with, you know, I want authors to to know that we meant it. We weren't trying. We bought we right. buy just first North American language or first English rights. Right. So I have a I want authors to know that if they're going that when it comes to second serial rights, you know, they have the rights to their story. We don't still have it up. It's a different, I guess it's a different um, 
way of looking at it. I know if an author sells a story to Neil, they know it's going to go up online and be up mm -hmm. there. Um, so I guess they're just different sets of expectations. Um, but it also doesn't interfere with their ability to sell reprints to other markets. In some cases, okay. it makes them easier because they because the story has picked up some legs and um, there you know I don't think we've heard I think maybe four years in we heard from one agent because they were trying to sell a collection and they were paranoid that it was going to ruin their chances of selling the collection instead of seeing it as as a marketing aspect yeah. um, which all the online editions are you know the yeah. online editions of the magazine are marketing we're really hoping that you pay for the the other thing um, uh, because that's the only way we'll keep going um, but I haven't heard from anybody saying, okay, well, this has got to come down because it's not, it's going to keep me from selling X, Y, or Z. And we've had authors sell film rights and they've still not had to come down. I think this is a, this, and, and I'm, you know, this is a little bit advanced inside baseball-y kind of conversation yeah, yeah. we're having here. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's a, an area under debate and discussion and changing expectations and changing market trends and Certainly, as Neil said, like when, when we started Strange Horizons 20 years ago, everything we were doing was kind of contrary to um, the industry standards and, mm -hmm. and lots of people thought it would crash and burn. And there are things that I would, if I could go back in time, the only thing I would change is I would build in budget for the editors. So like, that's the one mistake <laughs> I think I made. Same but, mistake here. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> Leaving that aside, um, I think the model works pretty well. And it, it does, it is dependent on annual crowdfunding campaigns, which can be a little stressful. But I think once you get to a certain point where you have a big enough audience that you you pretty much know you're going to hit it, you're kind of okay again. So we had like 15 years time. of stress and then you relax a little. So yeah. you may not want to do the crowdfunding campaign, but I, I think it's not as stressful as it was in the early days. Mm. Of course, I don't have to run them anymore. So, um, <laughs> but, so okay. Let's let's get back to the um, uh, writer questions. Uh, Darius, who is uh, Darius, is our managing editor at the SLF, but he's a former student of mine and uh, a young writer. Um, so he asks, "I've heard the," and he's going to be sending you guys stories soon. He's going to finish them and submit them. So um, he's been working on a novel, but I've been pushing him to do some short stories and send them out. Uh, he says, I've heard the advice of making sure your story starts with an interesting hook. Is that because editors decide whether or not they will read an entire story based off a good hook? So maybe Neil, you want to start and then Sheila? Um, the hook is a very Anglo-centric uh, way of writing. Um, so I try not to be overly dependent on that. Um, I will read into a story and if I'm not seeing something, I may skip ahead a bit, uh, see if it picks up. And sometimes the story just never picks up. Uh, and uh, so that's that tends to be my approach to it. I think the hook is still so important. I mean, in the sense that um, if the opening of the story is boring, it's going to be hard for me to continue reading. But as Neil says, there can be openings that aren't overly dramatic or anything, mm -hmm. but they're still interesting. It's it's a again, like I said, with that character with the standing on their head, I was like it was kind of the hook what kind of was like why is this person doing this it wasn't um and obviously it was a huge amount of drama i had another story which was a first sale where a mother was just trying to get her kid dressed to go to daycare but there was something about the writing that was just a, really brought me in and it was incredibly believable and then she was going off to her day job as a rope pretending to be a robot waitress and you know, normally I'd say, you know, a story set of a character who works at a fast food restaurant does not actually sound interesting, but written well, you know, it really was very interesting. And um, so what it is we're looking for is something that uh, makes me want to know why, what direction the story is going in and why it's going there, you know, makes you want to continue reading it doesn't have to be, you know, an exploding spaceship. It doesn't, you know, doesn't have to be characters under attack or it, but it, it just piques my interest as to why, what I want to know more about the story. I want to keep reading to find out what's going to happen. Yeah. I would actually say, I, I kind of think like in a science mega fiction magazine, a story about 
you know, someone in a service job, a waitress, et cetera, would kind of be more interesting to me than like someone who's captain of the spaceship in the first paragraph, right? I'm like, oh, there's going to be something cool here, right? Like, why is why is this story going to be science fictional? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I think what I was trying to say is sometimes yeah. I get a lot of stories where they're set like in a cubicle or something. And I have actually even bought a couple of stories who were set in a cubicle, but most of the time the character is extremely bored and their life is very boring. And I say, you know, if your character is bored, <laughs> there's a good chance the reader is going to be bored unless there's a very good dramatic reason for this. So that's all I was trying to say now. Yeah, that, that makes more sense. Story, yeah. The Waitress was never, that was never a boring story at all. But, yeah. but I just meant that some, in the wrong hands, it could have been yeah. very well. It's how it is presented and how it's done that, mm -hmm. you know, that was why these things work. So this is why I almost and always say, please don't have your characters be waking up. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's always kind of dull, except in very, very rare, rare instances. Like I bought a story from Michael Swanwick recently, but in general- He managed to pull it off, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there's a, sorry, I lost my thread for a second. Um, the, the, I, I, one of the things we talk about in class is that you have to give the editor and the reader a reason to keep going, right? And so it could be a dramatic hook of some kind. It could be beautiful prose. It could be a really intriguing character. It could be, it could even be a setting, right? A really fabulous setting description might be enough to pull them in. So there's, you do have to give them a reason, but it doesn't have to be a plotty reason. And I think that's maybe a little more in the pulpy tradition, which leads us into the next um, question here. So Adrian asks, do you aim to publish work that is more literary in style or is that just the kind of work you receive? Which I think is implying that Adrian thinks both of your publications publish a lot of literary work, which I would agree. Um, do you get many submissions that are more pulpy, edgy, experimental, et cetera? So I don't know which one, if either of you wants to take that. I know Str Strange Horizons, I know we were always very, I don't know right now what the editors are looking for, but we were always interested in slipstreamy kinds of things and open to experimental structures and so on. Um, I don't know that we got so many submissions along those lines, but um, it was always interesting when we did. I'm well, open. it's kind of funny because I, I see pulpy and edgy is opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, pulpy to me is very predictable um, mm -hmm. and I don't want predictable. Whereas mm -hmm. edgy is gonna be doing something a little bit different and might surprise me. And so I tend to fall a little bit more that direction. Um, experimental, you can you can play around. I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot, but um, you know, and there's been, there's been some stories that that uh you know we've gotten emails like what was that you know <laughs> it's like <laughs> and, but you know it's 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 uh you know good story and i stand i stand by those yeah well you know it's an interesting thing you can even with pulp piece tropes you can tell an interesting story mm -hmm. that isn't going in the direction that you don't want it to be a story that somebody would have written in 1945 or something and we just I published a story last year a rocket for Demetrios by Ray Naylor which definitely uses certain tropes from you know pulp fiction and many and other things besides but is extremely also beautifully written very literary in style too and I think that again I mean I'm terrible I'm always the really of the of, I'm looking for the stories that I like, which is a terrible thing to say, but um, some of the time, meant much of the time, I mean, the stories are, can be literary, well-written, but you know, one interesting thing in a cover letter is we will never, the credential that says I've sold to a literary magazine is never for me a good credential because it doesn't, <laughs> it just doesn't prove, you know, anything about writing science fiction or fantasy just because you've written, you know, for a literary market. And I've been buying, I mean, I bought a beautiful story recently from a, a guy, Joel Armstrong, who I think mainly is published in literary markets. Um, and just this was really lovely story set, a guy managing a graveyard um, and not a ghost story. Um, and 
but the, you know, I don't have like, I'm not set out with, oh, this is what I'm looking for, but it is, I like the balance too. Like I have, I have these stories, say Pete Woods who writes, or Pete Wood, who writes these very funny stories. And he definitely uses tropes from 50 science fiction just to kind of send them up. And they're all set in like South Carolina where people eat all the time. Mm -hmm. They're always eating barbecue in these stories, but they're just fun and they're funny. And they also help to break the tension. You know, you can have a really dark, sad, tragic story. And then and I can put Pete after that and, you know, kind of break up the, the tension so that the, the reader gets a mix of material, not mm -hmm. all one kind. Um, so I'm looking all the time for like a real range of material. Yeah, I think, um, sorry, I keep losing my thought. Um, when, oh, oh, just the, when I'm editing, I, I'm trying to think like I wouldn't, if someone wrote essentially a Conan the Barbarian story and they wrote it straight up, I can't imagine that I would be interested in publishing it. Like Conan did that, you know, like it's done. Um, so I'd be looking for something new, but I, I will say like, um, I teach Charles Saunders Imaro, which is um, his response to Conan the Barbarian. And it's uh, a black um, sword and sorcery figure. And what he does with heroism and community relationships and so on is super interesting. Um, so if if your love is for the pulpy material, um, I think I, I think any editor would just say like bring something interesting to it, bring something new. Yeah. Um, no, no, I agree. We you know we each generation stands on the shoulders of the ones that came before. Don't give me their stories. I want your version right. of it. I mean, we we just. Uh, you know, in, in December, we published a, a response story to the cold equations. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's one that was been responded to a lot, but it's also, you know, I still get into arguments yeah. with people about oh, the yeah. equations. <laughs> so, so it clearly got legs. Um, okay, let's get a couple more questions in. Uh, Jess asks, how does length of your story, short story versus novelette versus novella, affect your likelihood to be published? I know that blog posts have covered the publication stats for Clark's World, but I'd love to hear it talked about. And I'll, I'll start by saying my most reprinted story is one of my shortest and funniest. So I've only, I hardly ever write funny, but if you can do it, um, it tends to be an easier sell in my experience. So, um, although humor is very individual, but uh, so either one of you want to take that on? Like when, when stories are coming in, is the length going to affect it in terms of your likelihood to be published to accept the story? And you've got guidelines that say up to X many words, yeah. but you know... I, I have I have a story right now that I'm like trying to get down to like just under the guideline <laughs> for Clark's world. So because um, it's long. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, uh, the series of posts that he's alluding to is, or, or mentioning there um, is uh, where I went over the 2021 statistics from submissions to to publication. And um, it's funny because the year before we had published probably the most novelettes we had ever published. And then we saw a sudden drop off. Um, it, it's more a factor of what we're getting and the quality at that length. We're going to take it, you know, it, the, where it becomes more difficult. There's a reason we have a 1000 word cutoff. And it's because I don't find a lot of those really short flash fiction stories substantive enough to, to hold my attention. There are exceptions, but the majority are no. And we're just basically saying, you know, we're not the right market for that. Um, so, you know, down at the lower end, it, it can be harder. Um, and all the way at the top, you're, you know, if I'm going to take that much of an issue and dedicate it to you, it's, it's going to have to, to um, really be something I, I'm strongly uh, enamored with. But when I think about it, it's pretty much the same case for all of them. Um, you know, I, I, I want to be an, completely enamored with everything I buy. Yeah, yeah. I would say one of the things, you know, don't don't pad your fiction. Mm. You know, it should be the length that this, you know, the story has to be the length that works best for the story. 
don't try to turn it into a novella or a novelette just because you think you've got a better shot at that category. Um, on the other hand, I had a great story from somebody one time, but I was like, oh my God, I really, this story would work a little better if it was like 2,000 words longer. I had no idea what was happening at the end of it. It was a 5,000 word story. And the author said to me, oh, well, I, I wrote it as a challenge to write under five, to write a 5,000 word story. And I cut out 2,000 words. I said, well, could you put them back in, please? Because this is not making any sense to me. Um, and so don't just kind of artificially, I know I see a lot of short, stories because people have heard that it's easier to sell them and you know it's really important to look at every word make sure that you've got the right words in your story and you're not overwriting you're not you know taking saying a, a point with three words you could say with one but at the same time if the story requires you know it requires eight thousand words it requires eight thousand words it's not um you know it it's there's, there shouldn't be an artificial reason for making it a different length. And we have a lot of freedom at Asimov's. We have a lot of space. I actually do sometimes go over. I, I publish whatever my published limit is, 20,000, whatever I have gone over. But novellas have to stand out because there is only so much room. Um, but I do, as like Neil says, I want everything to stand out. So I'm not saying that you're going to coast because you sent me a short story. I agree with Neil on the 1,000. I have the same. I don't actually say it's a limit, but I really don't, because I discourage authors from sending me anything less than that. Um, and generally, I find that the shortest stories I buy are probably around 1,500 at the shortest, and I don't buy a lot of those, um, because I, it's not enough for me to, I don't want a joke. I don't want a story that's just kind of, the, it's kind of based on a punchline. Or I want something that actually tells a story with, with you know, and that I can, um, relate to the characters in the story. So um, sometimes there are intellectual thought experiences going on in the story and then they might be able to get away with fewer, mm -hmm. shorter length. But, um, but again, it's still, I like to see, you know, I still want something with a little meat on it. So, um, but yeah, yeah, so, I think, oh, sorry, Sheila, go ahead. I'd also say I buy more short stories than anything else because that is what I see more than anything else. I think daily science fiction, is that the one that only does flash fiction? So if, if you're writing flash fiction, there's a market just for that. So I would definitely say, go try them. Um, but I, I would agree. I think it's, it's hard to do something substantive in less than a thousand words. Um, another guideline I, I would say is, you know, the story kind of, the story has a natural length, right? This, as you're writing the story, it's gonna wanna be a certain length. And if you try and like drag it too much in one direction or another, I, I just think that rarely works. So um, it ends up feeling padded or feeling truncated and it just becomes, becomes sad. Neil, you look like you wanna say something. Yeah, yeah. I'm just remembering when we started out, we, we had a 4,000 word limit. You know, mm -hmm. We're at 22 now, but we were 4,000 then. And everyone used to complain, oh, my natural limits, are, my natural story is around 5,000. And mm -hmm. they'd send us, and the, the quality of the submissions was really good because they were editing them down to, to get mm -hmm. them in. And when we rose it to 8,000, we noticed a quality drop because they stopped mm -hmm. editing their stories down. So I think, you know, there, there's, you know, you know, a lot of people who say, you know, you could, you know, when you're finished, try and try, even as an exercise, cut 10% you know, see if you can do it. I um, very good. And, yeah. And it's, it's, um, you know, it, it, the most common, uh, you know, if, if there's going to be a big edit, it most commonly is going to be a cut, not an ad. Mm -hmm. Ads happen, but they're, they're so rare in comparison to the cuts. I think I'm an atypical writer. So maybe you guys shouldn't listen to my advice because of my, <laughs> my workshop every, every, time I give them a story they're like Marianne this has to be longer you just I skim over things so anyway so so don't listen to me on this one all right let me let me get a couple more we have a bunch more questions um Emmanuel's question is very quick I think I can maybe even answer it I didn't even know we had to do cover letters for submissions until I was making my first submission I hope that was in my class and I told you what to do but um Emmanuel is also a former student of mine I've read articles basically all saying that it's very different from a cover letter for a job what are some things that definitely belong in a cover letter 
So I, I would say a cover letter is mostly a filing document, right? Um, it's not selling your story. Uh, you, so you need to have the, your name, the title, the word count. Um, and, you know, maybe your most, re if you have publications, maybe your most recent publication, if you've been to one of the big science fiction fantasy workshops, you might mention that. Um, Neil, Sheila, anything you want to add or say about cover letters? Um, yeah, it's definitely not meant to be a, a like a letter that you'd send if you were applying for a job. And I get plenty that are like that, believe me. Um, but no, you're, you, you keep it. I do not want to tell me the plot of the story. Maybe a, a brief sentence, but basically uh, I want to, I want to, it's actually a good question there because I want other people to know that too, is that I don't want the story summarized in the cover letter. Science fiction and fantasy has a tendency to sound kind of silly when it's summarized, when you're not actually reading the whole story and and um, and seeing what the author is doing with this idea. So I really discourage people from doing that. Um, and then I think um, you can put in a little about your background if your background is germane to the story. You know, um, if you have had some experience that you're using to tell the story. You know, you, you, you're a pilot and you writing about flying or whatever, it could be anything um, that can be useful. But as I said, as I, re I look at the cover later, later, so it really isn't that, um, yeah. isn't that important. And there's a little bit of a glitch in my system that a lot of people think they have to put a cover letter and they don't, you can get around that by just putting a space in or a period or whatever. Um, I don't mind if there's no cover letter at all. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, that point about if you have expertise is like, you've written a story about a sanitation engineer on Mars, and your day job is sanitation engineer, you could mention that, right? Like, I know all these details are accurate, right? <laughs> um, I, you're, you're not going to have to fact check this for me. So, uh, Neil, anything to add? Um, I have a link to uh, some in our guidelines to that says, here's, here's what we look for or don't look for in a cover letter. The reason I read the cover letter last is because they're terrible and they were biasing me against the stories. Yeah, yeah and, and I think um, Isaac, uh, um, sorry, Gardner Desois, who edited Asimov's before Sheila, I, re I remember him talking about this on a panel at one point. And this actually, I, I meant to say this before, this actually goes to the hook question. He was saying that, you know, he would have these huge stacks of manuscripts and he really would like, if the first sentence didn't make him want to read the first paragraph, that was it. He it was done, right? And if the first paragraph didn't want to make him want to read the rest of the page, that was it. He was done with that story, right? And different editors have different philosophies on that. I think when Jed was senior fiction editor at Strange Horizons, he at least skimmed to the end of every story. Um, but Jed is extremely conscientious. <laughs> and, um, I think many editors do not feel the need to do that. Uh, but Gardner said that he um, that it was it was a that, I think that's where I got the phrase that it was a, a filing method for him. Like it was when when he was going back to write to the author to accept or reject or whatever, that's when he looked at the cover letter to get their name and how to contact them. So, it was more important before yeah. uh, the electronic system. You the cover letter then is where you found the address and you know you found a lot of information. But nowadays, I just Neil's have, has me all set up so I have it automatically, and yeah, um, that's what makes it even less important now than it was then. Yeah, I would agree. Um, okay. Uh, we've got a couple more questions. Lauren asks, I'm an academic who publishes peer-reviewed scientific articles. I also sometimes write op-eds for popular press. I've never published fiction. Under these circumstances, would I be considered a quote-unquote new writer? I think yes. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Right. We, we all agree yes. <laughs> so, um, so welcome to fiction. It's fun. <laughs> so um, ML asks, does the sci-fi fantasy element have to be crucial to the story? I.e., is there a preference for a story that's mainly about, say, a father-son relationship taking place in a fantastic world versus a story in which the fantastic element is crucial to that same father-son relationship? So maybe, Sheila, do you want to? Um, well, I think that the fantastic element generally is integral to the story in one way or another. Sometimes it's a lot more subtle. Um, you know, I read a story that a 30 page manuscript set in uh, Hitler's bunker. I couldn't figure out till page 27 what the fantasy 
element was going to be, but I was learning a lot about electrical engineering, which was fascinating. Um, but uh, you want, it is, a, we are a science fiction and fantasy market. So I don't want the, that element to just be tacked on like, oh, I want to sell this story to Asimov, so I better put a quote unquote dinosaur in it because you want it to be important to the story in some way or other. It could be more subtle or more obvious, but um, you know, I don't just want a story about a marriage falling apart and you know, the kind of story I want there if they're if they are going to be on a safari watching dinosaurs in the late Cretaceous, that's an important, I want that to be an important element of the story, not just say, well, I gotta, I'm not gonna sell this to Asimov's or Clark's world if it's just about a marriage falling apart. Um, so I think it, it's important to integrate it well, but it doesn't have to be overwhelming. Okay, Neil? Yeah, it's pretty much the same for me. I I, I tend to say it it, ha it needs to be baked in, not bolted on. Nice. Right. Yeah, and I guess the the I, I think this is that's true for most of the genre magazines. I think they'd say the same thing. Um, the way I tend to think about it, like I've sold, I'm writing this series of war stories set in the future to both both Asimov's and Clark's world have published stories set in that series, and the question I ask myself is, you know okay, I'm mostly writing about the war in Sri Lanka in some ways, which was a conflict that happened over 30 years and is past, but what would change? What would be different about how this would play out if it were happening in the future? We're 100 years in the future on another planet. Um, you know, maybe there are aliens, maybe there's technology, maybe there's, you know, what, what, is, what would change about that situation? And one of the things we talk about in class is, you know, science fiction is, um, one of the things it does is it gives us this sense of cognitive estrangement, right? It, it, it shows a different lens on the world. We're always, I would say, I don't know if you guys agree, I'd say we're always writing about ourselves, humans, the real world, et cetera, but doing it through that science fictional lens lets us see things from another angle and sometimes helps us see things more clearly because we're not bringing all of our present day prejudices and assumptions to the topic. So, um, so, <laughs> so does that, I don't, does that make sense to you both or I don't know? I think that what I find with science fiction is it's, it's, I don't, I generally don't want a story unless it's kind of with a little fantasy element or something. I don't really want a story set in today's world, exactly mm -hmm. today's world, because we're too immersed in it Things are changing too fast, um, but it, but science but science fiction can be a metaphor. Mm -hmm. You can write about today. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just. But you can you need to use a metaphor as a metaphor. Neil, do you want to add anything? Or no, I think you can that's, argue that's, with me. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I I think you guys are you're on the right track there. It's uh it, yeah. It, it can be used used well. I mean, there, there's uh, certain elements of, of science fiction that are inherently subversive in that regard. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, is, which is always funny when someone complains about a story being subversive uh, because it's just the part of part of the genre. They just don't they just don't notice it sometimes until it offends them. That's exactly what Stan Schmidt said. Nobody notices politics in a story until they disagree with it. Mm -hmm. Nice. All right. So we're getting close to wrapping up, I think. And we've run through the questions in the chat. So this is your last chance to throw a question in the chat. Um, but I had a question. Um, since I'm not seeing anything popping up there, let me let me give you my last question then. So uh, I was just at ICFA and which is the International Conference on the Fantastic and the Arts, uh, the academic conference for science fiction and fantasy, or one of the academic conferences. And Sheila was there as well. Um, uh, Neil is often there. Sorry, we missed you. Um, but I wanted to talk about Farrah Mendelssohn was our guest scholar. And in her talk, she uh, was, the, her talk was on living in the rainbow age of speculative fiction. And which is great. I love that we're living in the rainbow age. But she was looking at 
things like at one point she was talking about how uh, unfortunately um, there are these anthologies that she called essentially like bar bar buddy anthologies, right? Where she would see the anthology, see who had edited it. And she knew from that who was likely to be in the table of contents because these were the people that she saw hanging out with this editor at the bar at conventions, right? So essentially someone who publishes their friends. And she said, um, and this is obviously a problem for the field in terms of diversity, right? Because, you know, there are some, I mean, she was talking about how there were some men who only hang out and drink with other men, for example, right? Um, so my, I, I think this is, mm, you know, not at all how the magazines work, but my, my, and I, I don't think all anthologies work this way. I do open calls when I edit anthologies. So it's much more like the magazine setup. But um, I was talking about bringing back the Fountain Award. So this is a very SLF specific question. So we did the Fountain Award and, and Neil, I don't remember, I, you may not have, Clark's World may not have started at the time we were doing this. We did this for a few years in 2004 to 2006 maybe, it might yeah, have been so, right around the time you were starting. Yeah. So, um, and it was modeled on the Pushcart Prize. And the idea was that we would ask magazine editors and anthology editors in the field to nominate up to three of their favorite um, stories that they'd published that year. And then we'd take all those stories, give them to a jury and choose a winner. And it was meant to be a means of highlighting um, because I, I, every magazine and anthology editor I know feels at the end of the year, like, oh, this is a story I really loved and it didn't get the visibility um, that I thought it deserved, right? And I really wish it was in front of more people's eyes, right? So, so it was a way of, of giving the editors a chance to do that. And so I was taught, we were, we've been talking at the SLF about bringing this award back. And when I mentioned it to Farah, she said, oh, you're just going to end up reproducing these terrible power dynamics because you're going to have all of these editors who publish their friends and they're going to just nominate their friends. Um, so I just love to have your take on this. <laughs> um, um, I want to jump in and say that I have often become friendly with people that I've published. I mean, I think because we share an interest in fantastic fiction mm -hmm. and uh, and we can talk about literature, we can talk about similar subjects, but I don't meet them till after I've bought stories from them. And there's plenty of people I've never met in person. Um, and I continue to be excited. You know, I'm never gonna get to meet Greg Egan in person, believe me, nobody else is either, but I'm always thrilled. I haven't bought everything he sent me, believe me, but I am always thrilled to see a Greg Egan story. And, um, it's, and I also, I have a philosophy that I try to get to know before I was the editor of the magazine, I kept, uh, it was one. And now that I've been the editor since 2005, it's two. I try to get to know, really know, like have a meal with two new people at every major science fiction convention I go to. Um, because it is easy to get comfortable with people you know. Although, as I say, they let you down. They don't always send you stuff either. But... <laughs> But, but I always want to push that. I want to get to know other people, new people in my world, because I don't want to be limited. And, I, and, and my daughter has just popped in to say that I promote new writers with, my, with the Dell Award for the best short story by a college student, science fiction or fantasy. But um, it, it would be strangulation. It may be different for an anthology, but for the magazine, I would be strangled by just publishing stories for people I know. Now, on the other hand, Connie Willis is one of my best friends in the world. And I, but I love her stories, you know, everything that comes in, I love it. I'm not gonna apologize that she knows how to write a story that I love, you know, at the same time, I've actually even published stories with people I'm not crazy about, but I won't admit who those are, um, <laughs> you know? But um, it, 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 it just, you can't run a real magazine with that kind of philosophy, you know? I. Anthologies might be different, but I don't see how you could possibly turn out a professional magazine. And I think part of why some anthologies are different are because there are a lot of anthologies that are not open call. Open call is a lot of work. You've got a huge slush pile to read, right? So there are 
some anthologies that people solicit from writer friends that they think will, you know, so they only have to read maybe 30 to 50 stories instead of 300 to 500 stories to fill the anthology. So it becomes, it's a little bit of a pra practical thing, but I, I think Farah is right that it does often reproduce these power dynamics. Um, Neil, any thoughts? I'm just chuckling because you're, you're <laughs> saying a lot of submissions and here we are as magazine editors reading a hell of a lot more than those yeah. anthologists ever get in, a, <laughs> in, in their open calls. Um, I don't like solicited submissions. It, it's not the way to get the best stories. It's a way to get the biggest names for the biggest publicity. Mm -hmm. um, it's a way to... Uh, uh, chase a certain demographic. Um, there, there's, it can be used as a tool for good in some cases if, uh, if you are soliciting outside your circle because you need to widen it. Right. Um, but most of them don't do that. Um, and and that's, that's the problem that she's recognizing. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, having done anthologies, uh, uh, even when, uh, even for my first anthology all the way back, you know, we, we did solicit stories because we had to, um, but I made sure there was an open call because I am worried that I will miss something because I didn't know that person or didn't know about that story or whatever. So I, I, I believe in casting an extraordinarily wide net um, and, and that's the only way I see getting what, I want to put forward. Um, yeah. I think yeah. it's it's important to to uh, uh, to work widely and in short fiction, like Sheila was saying, that the the churn that moving off to novels or moving or being solicited, which is the other, <laughs> uh, uh, causes you to always be looking for for something or someone new. Um, and I think it's one of the things that keeps this interesting for me. If I was working with the same dozen authors on every book or every issue, I would go insane. It'd be, uh, it, it would be stagnation and boredom. So, well, that's, that's great. So I, I, I think for the magazines, I, I'm amazed by how much you guys read, honestly, like the, the last open call anthology I did, I think I got somewhere between 300 and 500 submissions and a summer to read them in. And it almost killed me. I don't know how you manage your reading pace, but, but kudos to both of you. Um, so read fast. If you want to be a magazine editor, <laughs> um, work on that. Um, we, we did get two more questions. So I, I'm gonna close it off after these two questions, but I'd love to quickly ask you them. So KN asks for politics, um, is there a position that works better than others? And does this differ among magazines? I think it definitely differs to some extent. There are some that are kind of explicitly, you know, more, I mean, I, I think there are magazines that were established to be more traditional slash conservative in, in contrast to what they perceived as a very progressive bent. Um, your thoughts? As I said before, you don't, it, it's, in, you're thinking of your general readership, the readership wants to be entertained. Um, we stay away from really overt, we, I mean, we may have stories that consider, you know, what the world's gonna be like if abortion is illegal or, uh, you know, what the world is like if there's, genetic engineering or if you know you elect a president that's you know totalitarian or something but we don't want a story that is set in today's we want to take it that's the beauty of science fiction is you can take it out of today's world put it somewhere else and experiment with it and you you actually i think of a broader readership then because you're not you know your readers can't really object whether they agree or not because it's not going on right here um, but we're not really looking at, you know, we have plenty, we do publish a lot of stories that look at the effects of climate change. And that's very important. And I don't see how you can write science fiction stories about the future, short term future right now that don't deal with that. Um, I don't even, you know, it's, it's not even a political issue in my opinion, but you know, that's my opinion. Um, so there are, you know, there's certainly, we're looking at all kinds of angles, but I don't really want a story that's set and, you know, President Biden is a, you know, people talking, you know, as a character in the story or whatever, that's not what we're looking for in the magazine. Um, that's just my, you know, our position. Neil? 
Um, I think a lot of the times that people try to drive politics into their stories, they use a hammer. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's that's the instant out for me. I mean, I, I, it's not why I'm reading science fiction. Yeah, this, you know, for overt political messages, just I can turn on the news for that. Um, so, and and I also have to keep in mind that our readership is broad, not just American either. Um, so, writing a story about the current political state in the United States at any given time in the last twenty years or whatever isn't going to appeal to a certain percentage of those people. Mm-hmm. And by and large, it's probably gonna be pretty boring. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I'm looking for something, I'm looking to, to get away from what mm-hmm. I'm stuck with uh, in, in some cases. Um, so yeah, you can, you can deal with an issue that, that has politics associated with it, as Sheila said, by, by removing it from that context show a different perspective or show another take on that perspective in a, in, a, in a situation that is different enough from where we are now that it's, it doesn't immediately cause a stress response. Um, you know, yeah. and, and the good kind of stress or the bad kind of stress, it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. And also the stories that are set really close to home can date so fast. So something that yes. you might think is interesting right now, a year from now, well, you know, I'm looking at a plenty of stories right now. If they were set, that would never imagine that we'd have this huge war going on in Ukraine. And, you know, if they came in, say, three months ago. And so it's, and so it's, and it obviously they didn't predict pandemics, pre pandemic. So you, you run the risk of being just out of date or you dealing with something, you know, a problem that's changed and moved on. It just becomes, yeah, it's not as interesting to the reader as you might think it would be. So I, I'm going to, I think, disagree with you a little bit. I mean, I see what you're saying, but I'll give you just two counters, I guess. One one is um, there was an anthology, Welcome to Dystopia, that I was invited uh, to, and it was a response to Trump's election, right? So it was a very overtly, clearly political anthology it had a, you know, it had a take. It had a, you know, a, an overt angle that Trump being elected was going to lead to a dystopia, right? And then it was a set of science fictional stories about what that might look like. And so, you know, mine was a very near future story in which there was, um, you know, women lost the right to birth control, immigration, like people were getting deported right and left and center, et cetera, so on. So, whether you think that works or not, I, I think there's sort of a place for that kind of specific thing, maybe not in a general magazine, like it might be something that's more appropriate for, for a, a focused anthology. Um, and I guess I would also say as an editor, I think most editors have their own politics and like, I am unlikely to buy a story that's tremendously racist, right? Um, you know, I am unlikely to, by a story that reproduces the kind of Fred Hoyle science fiction of the 50s in which you have a bunch of men standing around um, discussing how they're going to save the earth from whatever while the women have no lines and serve them drinks, right? Um, I can't remember which Fred Hoyle novel it was that I read that in, but I just, like by the end of it, I wanted to throw it across the room. So so I, I guess it depends on what you mean by politics, but... Yeah. Well, I mean, you also yeah. said that it's the context and and yeah. and it is a different when you're doing a theme anthology where you're focusing on something political. Yeah, you're, yeah. that's that's going to be your aim. It's it's, you know. All the anim, all the animals are in the same pen yeah. um, in, in, in that, whereas in, in a more general purpose thing, it may it may fall flat. Yeah. All right, I think uh, the last question is a great one to close on. So would you like to shout out some of your favorite short story SFF writers, either emerging writers or established? Maybe instead of your favorites, maybe some recent stories and authors you've published that you'd love to draw people's attention to. Um, Things that they can go and read right now would be great. So I didn't let you prep. I didn't tell you to prep for this. If you need a minute to pull them up. I should go grab my cards. Um, That's right. I don't even know if I'm going to pronounce this name right. Um, well, I have a new writer. I really have enjoyed a couple of stories. Um, Jen Dai, 
Flemingster Brooks, I believe. I hopefully okay. pronounced that right. I don't know. I've never met, we've never met in person. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I, I mentioned, Joel Armstrong before, these are not, I'm not saying favorites, just interesting new people. Ray Naylor, of course, who's been around for a while now. Um, Suzanne Palmer, Sarah Pinsker, you know, there's a, the list is endless. They're just, you know, there's so many wonderful authors out there. Um, and I know I'm going to say, I'm going to walk away and say, why didn't I think of, <laughs> why didn't I mention so-and-so? If you had warned me, I might've uh, had a better, more comprehensive list. That's all right. Uh, Neil, is there anyone you want to draw people's attention to? Oh boy. All of them. Um, <laughs> the, <laughs> Let's, the latest let's see. Issue. <laughs> well, the, well, yes, the latest issue is always, oh, always, always some of my favorites. I mean, and and uh, it, it includes somebody that uh, Sheila just mentioned, Ray Naylor. Um, Naomi Kritzer did. It's funny you were talking about a dragon story with mm -hmm. science. She did a dragon story with science in, in our current issue. Um, um, there's, you know, RSA Garcia has has sent us some wonderful. Uh, novellas over the past few years, uh, you know, um, oh God, um, <laughs> it, you know, it's, it's, I'm no, I'm, I know that I'm just going to drop a whole, a whole bunch of names there that, that, you know, uh, Arula has been doing some amazing stuff. Uh, Isabel Kim is all over the place in the last couple of years and, and just done, not doing phenomenal work. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, that's, that's, I, you know, that's I'm just going to have to accept that I'm not going to get everybody down and just say, just it's, read the magazine. Yeah, <laughs> my index, the January, February issue always carries an index. And, you know, I would say I, Asimov's is full of stories that I love. So, you know, as you started this by saying, be familiar with the magazine, I think that that just shows that there are many authors. Um, they write, all, they're all different, all different backgrounds and and different takes and they're you know i was mentioned i um this michelle left from from voice from or from bois i guess this my french pronunciation um you know i'm going to really kick myself when this is over say oh why didn't i mention xyz but mm -hmm. um there's just it's huge we're very fortunate this field that we have so many diverse interesting talented writers we're very lucky so and so Darius, when he uploads this to uh, YouTube and our site, he's uh, going to try and get those names and links in the description. So um, so if you missed any of those names, look in the text. Hopefully it'll be there. Um, and I think that's we've kept you guys for for an hour and a half. Um, so longer than I said, sorry about that. But uh, thank you so much. This has been um, a tremendous privilege, I think. I, I suspect a lot of new writers don't know what a rare opportunity this is, right? To to get to talk to two of the foremost editors in the field. And, you know, in the old days, you had to somehow scrape together the money to go to a convention, maybe like cram four baby writers into a room um, to be able to attend a panel. Um, and now, now we have some other options and it's, I just really appreciate you both taking the time to do this for us. And I'd love to have you back to do a panel about editing aimed at baby editors. So, um, cause I think that would be a really interesting discussion as well. So. <laughs> and I, I have to say, I just saw one of my authors pop up in here, Jess, another, <laughs> another good story. So go check out her story as well. Jess Levine. Oh, that's so nice. Okay. Thanks for inviting us to do this. It was fun. Yay. Thank you so much. Sheila Williams of Asimov's, Neil Clark of Clark's World. Um, just, just fabulous having you both here. And thank you all, everyone who came and uh, threw the questions in. I thought it was a really interesting discussion. Um, so that's it. We're done. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Uh, bye. <laughs>